Um, yeah, so today I'm going to, I mean, I've briefly, I've titled this talk, the Solving the Mysteries of the Dark Universe, but um, I think one of the things that hopefully will become kind of apparent throughout this is actually, we really, really don't know very much at all, actually. So thank you, Ophelia, for the uh, introduction. So yeah, uh, my name is Fiona, and I work at UCL's MSSL. So... Uh, just to briefly introduce the subject, uh, we're going to quickly look at the contents of the universe. So chances are you've already seen um, an infographic like this one from NASA. And basically, it's it look, it's uh, showing the contents of the observable universe, what we can actually see. So one of the things that you'll hopefully notice from this pie chart is that actually visible matter so visible matter is, you know, the planets, the stars, you and me. Um, that actually makes up a very small chunk of this pie chart. It's only about 5%. The rest of it, um, at least in terms of matter, is about 27%, just under a third. But the vast majority of the universe seems to be made up of this, this dark matter, this term that we call dark matter. So the values that you see here are actually the most recent numbers that we've uh, gained from observation, and that's from the East Emission Planck. So um, one of the things about this, which is promising or sort of it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a good sign is that it's consistent with what we expect to see from our theoretical models. Um, so, yeah. And yeah, so let me just get into that in a bit. So if I go on. So yeah, so dark matter and dark energy are actually the fundamental components of a subject within astronomy called cosmology. So Ophelia was just saying that they are a planetary scientist. Um, I work in a field of astronomy called cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the universe at these really, really big scales. We're talking scales that are, you know, beyond, not just beyond the solar system or even the Milky Way, but beyond, you know, our local galaxy cluster and galaxy clusters as a whole. This is really interesting because it gives us an idea of the structure and distribution within the universe, which, uh, and we call this the large scale structure. And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, this is a simulation image. We don't actually have pictures of the large scale structure, but if you want to Google that in your own time, um, you'll see images like this one that I have in the background of Hubble. Um, this is the deep, this is a deep field survey. But if you look at sort of um, pictures of Hubble that have been stitched together, you'll see bits of this large scale structure starting to come through. So if you look in this little image here, if you consider each little pinprick of light there, as not a galaxy, but actually a cluster of galaxies within which the Milky Way might be one of them. That starts to give you um, an understanding of the uh, scale that we're actually looking at. So where does dark matter and dark energy fit into this? Um, I'm going to start with the short answer, which is basically that we don't really know. Uh, it's essentially all the bits that we can't directly observe, but they play a really large role in this large scale structure and how it evolves. For the long answer, uh, I'm actually going to give you a little in history into cosmology because it's pretty important. Because um, it's, yeah, our understanding of dark matter and dark energy are basically the kind of the conclusion, the final answer of a long convoluted history of cosmology and our understanding of it as it's developed over time. So historically, there have been loads and loads of theories about the nature and composition of the universe. This timeline just shows you a few key parts of them throughout history. Um, one of the major questions throughout history, actually, is whether or not the universe is infinitely or finitely old. So in other words, did the universe have a beginning or has it just, you know, always been around? Has it just always existed? In um, 1687, Isaac Newton published his great work, The Principia, which describes models and laws that govern the universe, including gravitation. So in his model, he described a static infinite universe with matter distributed so perfectly that it wouldn't collapse. And actually, this was the prevailing theory for almost uh, 250 years. Even Einstein uh, largely believed in this kind of finite and static universe. But a finite and static universe poses some troubling questions, some puzzling questions. One of which is, the most prominent, sorry, of which is, why is the night sky so dark? Um, actually, Johannes Kepler, who is the person who uh, predicted the motion of planets, 
Uh, he pondered this question all the way back in uh, 1610, but it wasn't until uh, 1823 that the paradox received the name known as Olber's paradox. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. So um, Olber's par paradox. So in a universe that is infinitely old, infinitely vast, and infinitely populated, the night sky should be bright. So you should look up into the sky and it should be like daylight all the time. So what we actually observe, as I'm sure you've all noticed when you look up at the sky, is that actually the night sky is dark and it's peppered with these tiny little pinpricks of stars and galaxies. So the question is, why is the night sky dark? So in 1610, Kepler proposed that stars only exist in a finite space. And that's why we're only seeing just a few bits. And the space beyond that is this sort of infinite unknown. But that does raise the question then, okay, so what is beyond the star boundary? Is there is there a universal edge or is it just an empty blanket sea? So Olbers himself uh, suggested that starlight is gradually absorbed as it travels through the universe to the Earth. However, this solution doesn't really work because eventually what you would see is that as this uh, starlight gets absorbed, as this energy gets absorbed, it will eventually be re-radiated. So ultimately, we would still detect something, whether it's light or uh, some other kind of electromagnetic radiation. So, but yeah, the universe would still be bright in that scenario. Uh, funnily enough, it was actually Edgar Allan Poe, the American poet, that suggested the universe actually isn't old enough for light from stars to have reached for light, sorry, to have reached us from dis distant stars. But it actually wasn't until 1929 when Hubble actually uh, discovered redshift, showing that some galaxies are sorry, showing distant galaxies are actually moving away, indicating that the universe is expanding. So not a static universe. But at the time, that was an idea that was so radical that even Einstein rejected it in, t in favor of an infinitely old and static universe. So let's talk about Einstein. Um, Einstein kind of revolutionized uh, cosmology and basically he is essentially the father of modern cosmology. So, like I said before, for nearly 250 years, the Newtonian model of gravity and the universe uh, persisted as the cosmological paradigm. So, on the left-hand side here, you can see Newton and his law of gravitation, where gravity is described as a force between two masses. Now, this all changed with Einstein. So, Einstein's theory of general relativity um was i think it was yeah 1915 1915 he published his theory of general relativity so general relativity completely shifted our perspective because now gravity was no longer being modeled as a force but it was actually a geometric theory so gravity in this model is not a force but it's actually a consequence of mass causing distortions in space time gravity is an effect not a force one of the key aspects of cosmology that I defined earlier in previous slides is that is um, describing the geometry of the universe and general relativity actually provides the framework to describe it. And that became the foundation of modern cosmology as we know it today. So yeah, um, just to describe this picture. So uh, to explain that, I'm sure you might have seen things like this where if uh, you'll see demonstrations of this online where you can imagine uh, sort of the general relativity model with space as a sort of blanket and then you can put a mass in the middle which causes a dip and that will cause things to circle around it sort of like a like a gumball machine that's kind of the example that i like to think of right gonna try not to freak you out guys but we're gonna have a look at the einstein universe and this formula here is the most simplified version of the Einstein field equations. Um, I promise I'm not gonna go too deep into the maths. Also general relativity is really, really hard. So I'm only gonna try and keep it surface level. But uh, basically this describes sort of the universe according to Einstein's theories of gravitation as opposed to Newton's. So basically you can view this these two variables are the, the things that you need to focus on. So this left hand side term um, refers to the space time curvature. So if you imagine what I said before about considering space as like a fabric, 
this um, this term basically describes sort of the landscape of that fabric. So any bumps, how it's stretched, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this term on the right hand side, this T term, that's um, that's the term that contains all the information regarding the matter, energy densities, all of that inside the universe. So it's effectively um, it's effectively a map of all the different parts of the universe and how it moves. So what this equation essentially shows you is that matter tells space-time how to bend. And um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so sorry, matter, te matter tells space-time how to bend and space-time tells matter how to move. So this, by the way, this middle term is just a constant. Um, so that's essentially just the strength of gravity. And actually it's the same, um, the same G here that's used in Newton's, Newton's gravity. So yeah, basically space-time curvature and matter and energy are intrinsically linked. You cannot separate the two. Like Newton, um, Einstein did believe in a static universe, but general relativity, as he described it, predicted a contracting universe. So, you know, if you think about that tarp again, you've got your your blob of matter here, things would just sort of pull in towards the center and contract. But that didn't work with Einstein's view of an infinitely old, static, unmoving universe. So the solution that he proposed was something called the cosmological Const constant, uh, which is called lambda. So what this is, is um, essentially like a constant force that opposes gravity. So if you imagine like, um, you know, when you have two magnets away with, with a north and south, how they sort of push against each other. So lambda is basically like the opposite, uh, the opposite force, if you will, to gravity. But just remember that gravity isn't a force. So let's go back to the Einstein field equation. So in practice, what does that look like? We basically modify it now to include our cosmological constant. So if you remember this sort of right-hand side term, which talks about the matter distribution of the universe, uh, so we can change that now to incorporate lambda. So this is our little lambda, our little cosmological constant. And that's just, um, yeah, so that literally just stops the universe contracting because otherwise it doesn't work. So the thing is, Einstein would later refer to this cosmological constant as his greatest blunder, because when he was faced with the evidence of an expanding universe, um, he realized that this lambda just didn't make sense. There was no need to introduce it because we had a dynamic expanding universe, so there was no need for this lambda constant. However, we're going to see a little bit later, actually, that the cosmological constant is more useful than we than he than Einstein previously thought. And actually, it may not have been as big of a blunder. During the 1920s and 30s, after the publication of general relativity, two scientists independently solved Einstein's field equations to develop a model of the universe. And those two scientists are Alexander Friedman and Georges Lemaitre. These are two physicists and mathematicians who were working independently. So after Einstein's field equations were released, these two solved them to sort of uh, basically describe the universe as according to general relativity. So what they both found, though, is that um, according to relativity, if we follow Einstein's own model, the universe should actually expand according to some scale factor. So it was Lemaitre that actually proposed the idea of a scale factor to describe how the universe has changed and expanded over time. Um, so Lemaitre also ex extrapolated from that. If you looked back in time, the scale factor would indicate that the universe at some point would have been smaller. So if we take that one step further, we go back to this idea of, you know, a single point. So in many ways, Lemaitre is actually sort of considered the father of the Big Bang or the originator of the theory of the Big Bang, but he's not the person who called it the Big Bang Theory. But yeah, so at some point we had this primordial universe and uh, Lemaitre essentially came to that. So these two other gentlemen here, uh, Robertson and Walker, they developed the framework to describe the geometry of the universe, um, specifically at really large scales, because um, it doesn't, not necessarily at like the solar system level. Again, we're talking at this like beyond galaxy level. So um, yeah. So the idea of that is if you consider two separate points in the universe, A and B, 
uh, what they did was described um, a metric. So uh, like a relationship that shows, okay, so how are A and B related? So if you kind of consider like a ruler where you've got two points, it's like, how are those two points related? So they designed, I guess, the ruler of the universe, if you want to think about it that way. Eventually, these these two things were combined to create something that's widely known as the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric, which we're just going to call the FLRW. And that basically describes a, a universe, not necessarily our universe, but it describes a model universe that follows the laws of general relativity. So yeah, so the FLRW metric actually describes a generic universe. So it's a it's a framework, it's a model, but in this case, it describes a universe that follows general relativity. So the key assumptions of this FLRW metric is that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So let me break down what that actually means. Um, so it assumes, again, at these really large cosmological scales, if you imagine that you're an observer, some random observer at these large cosmological scales, no matter where you are, the universe essentially looks the same. So that's the homogeneous bit. The isotropic bit is that the universe looks the same in all directions. So um, the way to think about that is there's no discernible up or down. It would be like in a it, it would be like if you're in the middle of the ocean, you wouldn't be able to tell what was left, right, up or down. It all looks the same. So yeah. Um, so we can think of the universe as, this isn't accurate, but we can think of the universe as sort of like a box filled with fluid made up of all the different types of energy density, so matter, dark energy, so on and so forth. The Friedman equations describe how the universe expands over time according to the different energy densities and the curvature of space. The key thing in this model is that the rate of this expansion can change. Um, give me a second, sorry. So what is some of the evidence that we have this kind of expanded universe? So in 1929, Edwin Hubble discovered redshift. Now, redshift uh, is something that you would have come across, chances are, in your physics classes at school. But if not, um, let me just briefly describe what redshift is. So redshift is an observational effect with distant galaxies, where galaxies that are far away, they're spectral lines. So uh, we, we know the compositions of most galaxies, but what Hubble found was that those spectral lines were literally shifted, which kind of seemed to suggest that the galaxies had been stretched, had been moved away. So the light had, lit had physically been stretched. So what could cause that? The only solution that we can really think of is that space-time itself had stretched, causing these photons, these wavelengths to, to stretch out. And actually, there's a few other um, evidences for this, including the CMB, which we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, so uh, redshift basically shows that distant galaxies are moving away, which wouldn't happen unless space itself was expanding. Uh, one thing, though, to consider, though, is that the scale factor is an intrinsic property of space. So this is an intrinsic property of our universe. It's not something that we necessarily know the cause of. It's just as a result of the FLRW metric and general relativity. It's just a natural consequence of a universe that follows those laws. So, yeah. So that's that's um, that's redshift. Um, give me a second. So why have I spent all of this time talking to you guys about general relativity and space-time metrics when the talk is supposed to be about dark matter and dark energy? So as I said to you before, the short answer for that is we, we don't really know. Um, that is the short answer, but the long answer and the reason why I've given this huge rundown of cosmological history and this big background is that it's encoded in this metric, in this FLRW metric, which to be fair, I haven't included the equations of because I think, you know, even I struggle to read those. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I would not expect you to understand those. So let's talk about these energy densities then. So the first one is the one that we're all familiar with and that's matter. So that's, you know, humans, baryonic matter, 
so uh, baryons are uh, things like the atoms that you know. So protons, neutrons, those are all baryons. So that's that's our observable physical universe, things that we can actually see and measure. Um, and this is what, you know, we see that as well, causing distortions in our space time. Uh, the second is radiation. So radiation is, uh, in this instance, in the FLRW metric, radiation refers to massless particles. So photons, which are the individual energy particles of light. Um, I don't know if you would have covered this, um, but basically Einstein discovered that mass and um, mass and energy are interchangeable. So although light photons don't have a mass, they can still be considered a particle. So yeah, um, yeah, so this radiation sort of uh, it is basically quantified as energy. Um, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with Einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared. Uh, basically, what this shows or what this says is that um, mass and energy are essentially interchangeable. So this is really useful in the context of the history of the universe, since we can actually see how the relative density of mass and radiation have changed over time. So um, yeah, so that's the an energy density, energy density referring to things that can be matter or radiation or dark energy, which we'll talk about soon. So that's the final component, which is dark energy, which is this mysterious thing that we don't really know or understand. And actually, in the early 1920s and that uh, 20th century, that wasn't even a consideration. Dark energy wasn't a thing. So let's go back to our universe as a box of fluid. So the history of our universe can kind of be broken down into three epochs based on the different compositions of the universe, based on these different uh, energy species, actually, is what we call them. So, you know, going back to here, matter, radiation, and dark energy. So the early universe would have been the radiation epoch. So we're talking just after the Big Bang, and I think it's the first 380,000 years or so is what we consider this radiation-dominated epoch. So... Um, if we consider our box of fluid, like I said, you can kind of think about how um, if you, yeah, so in, in our box of fluid example, if you think about uh, like trying to put sort of, you know, gases and stuff into a box, as you expand the box, your pressure decreases, right? So same thing as like if you try and squash a big box filled with air down, the pressure inside is going to increase. So what this means really is at the beginning of the universe, in our early universe, it was really, really hot and really, really dense. So that causes a lot of pressure. Now in that early universe, we have a radiation dominance. So, but then as the universe expands, um, the redshift of photons, so bearing in mind, um, radiation in this case refers to massive particles, which refers to photons, those photons redshift so their wavelengths get longer and what that means practically is that they lose energy now we know that energy can neither be created nor destroyed but what we're seeing is a change in the relative energy density so as the universe expands photons lose their energy in terms of they have less energy it's the same amount of overall energy but it's distributed across a larger amount of space so practically we see that as a reduction in energy so what that does is causes a universe that cools down. And in this case, uh, the radiation epoch slows down. So radiation dro drives this huge expansion in the early universe, but then as it cools down, there's less pressure, so that decreases. And this is what we enter something called the matter-dominated epoch. And this is the, up until very re recently, sort of the 1990s, we believed that this is the epoch that was dominant and the one that we existed in. So in a matter-dominated epoch, we still see um, an expansion, still see a driven expansion. However, it's not at this crazy accelerated rate like it is with radiation. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So um, in this matter dominated epoch, we continue to see um, an expanding universe, but that expansion decelerates. So radiation causes an accelerated expansion, matter causes a decelerating expansion. That's not to say that the thing that um, the universe is going to shrink, but it's just that how quickly it grows is slowing down. So this is actually what Einstein believed in um, once he'd resolved the idea of a static universe. The general prevailing idea was that with a matter dominated universe is that the universe would continue to expand, but it would slow down in its expansion until it's just constantly expanding at a linear rate. So that's what we expected to observe. However, what we actually experience though is something else entirely. So the world that we exist in today, the era of the universe that we live in today is what we call the dark energy epoch and it's a complete mystery. So our dark universe. So what is the evidence of the fact that we live in this dark universe? So first of all, um, while all of this relativity stuff is happening, alongside that, um, uh, observational astronomers are looking at the stars and looking at the galaxies and they're observing something that's very interesting. So the first thing that was observed is that galaxies are rotating far faster than they actually are supposed to. So, um, you know, it's the, the idea of momentum, basically. So the heavier something is as you swing it around, the more momentum it has. So what we were observing is that galaxies were spinning as though they had a high amount of mass, but based on what we could visibly see, that didn't make sense. So um, that was part of the evidence that suggested that we had a galaxy, or sorry, we had a universe that contained matter that we couldn't see or that we couldn't detect. Um, if we remember this radiation epoch stuff that I was talking about as well, although the FLRW didn't directly predict um, the cosmic microwave background, uh, other scientists, other physicists at the time did, however, predict that model. So that was done in the 1940s. And then in 1965, the cosmic microwave background was actually discovered. And one of the fascinating things about the CMB is that, as you can see, it's pretty uniform. And this is in keeping with our idea of this sort of uniform, isotropic, homogeneous universe. So this is what the CMB is, and but one of the things that we can see in the CMB. So this is a this is a picture of the CMB from Planck. Um, is you see these little clusters? Those clusters align with what we expect to see with dark matter. So the CMB is evidence of a dark matter model, but also it's evidence of the radiation epoch, since it's kind of like the la It's kind of like the blink. It's the uh, the echo of the Big Bang. But it's shifted as it's as the universe has expanded. That explosion has become longer, and it's now a microwave. But it's it's uniform in distribution, and it shows these pockets, which indicates dark matter and uh, some of the cosmic structure formation. In the 1980s, a phenomenon called gravitational lensing was observed for the first time. Now, gravita gravitational lensing is fascinating, and this is the subject that I work on primarily. It is, uh, I'm sure you've all been told, uh, one of the first things that we learn in physics is that light travels in a straight line. Light travels in a straight path. That is what light wants to do. I'm going to tell you now that light doesn't travel in a straight line. What light does is it travels in the shortest possible path according to the universe or according to the space time that it's going through. If you remember, um, what I was saying about general relativity is that mass distorts space-time. Really, really big masses cause massive distortions, and actually, uh, that's the Einstein predicted the existence of black holes from general relativity, which are these huge, huge distortions. But at a very, at a much smaller level, what we see is these pockets of mass kind of dimple our space-time fabric. So now, if you have your light beam sort of shooting across the universe. It's not actually going to stra travel in a straight line. It's going to travel and it's kind of kind of wiggle. So what that looks like um, observationally is when you look at the the map, the sorry, the sorry, the night sky as a whole, you start to see this kind of like intrinsic alignment of galaxies, and that's not supposed to happen. Or in a completely universe homogeneous universe, that wouldn't happen. But we see an alignment. 
which shows that there's some hidden mass that we can't see that's causing light to bend on its path towards Earth. So this phenomenon is called gravitational lensing. Um, there's two types of it. There's weak lensing and strong lensing. I don't have a picture of it here, but I highly encourage you guys to look up something called um, an Einstein square, which is a crazy, crazy result of, um, of, of general relativity, uh, strong lensing. It's basically, yeah, you... So what gravitational lensing literally does is it it scales up stars and stuff. So the same object you can view four different times because of the way lensing works. It's a bit weird, but yeah, uh, gravity acts like lens, like like the ones in my glasses or like the ones in the camera. And there's some really clever uh, equations that link that together. So yeah, gravitational lensing. Um, what we, in order to study sort of the large scale structure though as a whole, we're more interested in something called weak lensing, which is these big maps. So in the 1990s, this is when big scary discovery happened, the one that no one was expecting. Uh, this was done in combination with the Hubble telescope as well, but these, these two observations happened independently. Um, these type one supernova, type one A supernovae project noticed that distant objects, these distant supernovae, were actually moving away. They're, they were further redshifted than expected, which suggests that they were moving away faster than expected, suggesting a universe that was expanding at an accelerated rate. So uh, the reason why we know this is these type 1a supernovae, they're what we call standard candles. So we know they're very well understood, very well uh, researched. So we know how bright and what they're supposed to look like. So looking at ones that are far away we can see that they aren't they don't look the way that they're supposed to and that's how we kind of figured out that the universe was expanding at an accelerated rate now remember einstein didn't know this none of these uh, physicists back in the 1920s or um, the 20th century as a whole had any idea that this was going on it was largely considered to be you know, we knew that the universe was expanding, or that was the widely accepted model, but the idea was that the universe would eventually slow down in its expansion. The idea that the universe would not only keep expanding, but expand at an accelerated rate, that was completely out of what was expect expected and was this huge, huge surprise. So, remember Einstein's, Einstein's cosmological constant that he hated so much and called his hugest blunder? Turns out we're reintroducing it. The simplest explanation that we have for a universe that's expanding at an, at an accelerated rate is the cosmological constant, it's lambda. What we call that, or the term that we now refer to that as, is dark energy. So uh, what are the actual candidates for these two different entities? Okay, I'm not going to go into this in detail because uh, this is actually a part of physics that I'm not particularly familiar with, but this is just to let you know how much we really don't understand about these subjects. So these are, all, these are just some of the candidates for dark matter. Um, these are all theoretical. And the big problem with dark matter is that we can't observe it, we can't detect it. Dark matter is uh, only observed through its impact on the things around it. So through this large scale structure, which, you know, I'm reusing the image from a previous slide, and also through uh, the observation of momentums of galaxies. We can't actually see dark matter. We can't actually observe it because it doesn't seem to interact with, um, with things. It doesn't release, um, it doesn't interact um, with elect electromagnetic forces. So this is also why we call dark matter, or the current model refers to dark matter as cold dark matter, because we don't detect it in any way. So there's no no radiation coming off of it. But it makes it really hard to prove, because how do you prove something that you can't measure? So this is why we have all of these candidates for dark matter, but we don't really know what it actually is. Uh, some of the most compelling ones are probably WIMPs. But yeah, yeah, that's that's actually what they're called. They're called wimps. Physicists have a funny sense of humor. Um, but yeah, so we but we really genuinely don't know what dark matter is, and it's a prevailing thread that if we can't resolve the dark matter problem within the next sort of few decades, we might have to rethink the entire model of cosmology. What about the candidates for dark energy? 
Now, if dark matter is an unknown, then dark energy is just a massive question mark. We have no idea what dark energy is. So the most simple explanation is the cosmological constant. However, uh, what that actually is remains to be seen. Uh, one of the biggest con biggest contending theories at the moment is it's the it's called vacuum energy. So the idea of vacuum energy is that space itself, you know, the void that fills the gaps between planets, has some kind of energy associated to it. So we call that vacuum energy. And the standard model of um, particle physics uh, is supposed to be unified with general relativity. So that's another big problem with the current model of cosmology and the current model of physics as a whole, is we can't actually unify the standard model of quantum physics with uh, the standard model of cosmology. And actually one of the biggest problems that comes up is his vacuum energy, because according to quantum physics, the value of vacuum energy that we would expect to see is in the magnitude of like 120 times bigger than what we actually observe. So I'm not saying 120 times bigger. I'm saying the magnitude is 120 times bigger. So it's 10 times 120 zeros. So it's completely absurd. And we have no idea why this is the case and how to resolve that. One of the solutions for that is extra dimensions. It's this idea that um, there are these hidden dimensions that we don't, we can't measure, and that contains all of this hidden energy, and we don't know where it's going. The other is uh, quintessence. So quintessence is sort of the opposite to the cosmological constant. It's this idea that dark energy fluctuates and has changed throughout time, because the current model of dark energy basically suggests that it's just this constant thing that's just driving expansion, but quintessence suggests that it could be something else in which case it might be uh, more nebulous and flowy. And if it is a quintessence model, then um, that completely changes what we would expect to see as the future of the universe. So what is the fate of our universe according to dark matter and dark energy? So the current cosmological model, the standard cosmological model that's uh, basically mostly accepted. This is the model that Planck supports at the moment, is lambda cold dark matter. So lambda referring to cosmological constant and cold dark matter referring to the matter density that we can observe. So, you know, most matter, remember, in the universe is dark. We can't see it. So one of the cool things about our universe, though, is it appears to have a curvature close to zero. So uh, we live in a flat universe. That's th we, we don't live in a 3D universe, but we live in a flat universe. So what that means overall is there's a really good way of explaining this that I'm not so good at. But if you kind of imagine that you're walking, right? You're walking from point A to B. In your flat universe, you have, you have two friends walking next to each other. In your flat universe, after 100 meters, you'll both still be next to each other. Um, the other two models, so positive and negative curvature, show that either you keep walking along this path and you'll diverge, so that's an open universe, or you have a closed universe where over time you'll converge and you'll cr crash into each other. However, what we actually observe is a flat universe, so that's great. Um, the big thing that we need to try and resolve then is something called the equation of state of the universe, so if we go remember the the universe is a big box with, filled with fluid. That fluid has a pressure and energy density. So I'm not going to sort of talk about this in too much detail, but basically we have this quantity, this equation of state, which is denoted by W, and it relates the pressure with the energy densities of the universe. So this, this little symbol here, rho, refers to the energy density of the universe. Now, the ultimate fate of the universe depends on the value of that W. So in a matter-dominated universe, or one of the theories of a matter-dominated universe, that W would be a third. And this was one of the prevailing theories for a long time, was we lived in a universe that could be heading for something called the Big Crunch. Now, this is where the critical density or the critical mass of the universe is high. So, sorry, that we don't exist at critical density. So at critical density, we have this flat universe, nothing happens. But in this case where W is greater than a third, 
in this matter-dominated universe, we would see that not only the expansion would slow down, it would actually reverse. Um, so actually, this is very similar to the cosmic egg idea from some societies in the past, right? So essentially, you have a universe that expands until it gets cold, 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 and then gravity pulls back, pulls the universe together into a big crunch. We return back to the original singularity, and everything goes there. Um, the other, the other two most popular or most realistic scenarios is that we have a W of approximately minus one, which is the big freeze. And this is what we're trying to solve. So this W being approximately minus one, this is a dark, dark energy dominated universe. And this is what we suspect to be the universe that we live in today. And it's a pretty depressing idea, actually. Um, it's this idea that the universe is going to keep expanding at an accelerated rate. So basically, um, the galaxies and all the clusters that we see today are going to move further and further apart from each other until eventually they're so far apart that light won't even connect to these galaxies. So the universe is just going to get ever bigger, ever darker, and ever colder. So yeah, it's a bit, bit sad. <laughs> And um, the more dramatic uh, example of this is a case where W is even smaller than minus one. So it could be minus 1.5 or minus two. And this is a scenario called the big rip. Now, if the big rip is going to occur, it would probably occur in the next 20 billion years, but it seems unlikely. So the big rip is a dark energy universe where the, dark, the force of dark energy is so powerful that it physically rips the space between atoms apart so the universe literally rips wide open that doesn't seem to be the case we seem to be leaning more towards a universe that is going to go into this big freeze now if we have this quintessence model which you know we don't know if that exists that w could actually be changing and if that's the case who knows what we're going to see in the future but as it stands right now the universe is likely going to keep expanding forever and we already kind of see an example of that, which is the cosmic horizon. So the observable universe being 13.7 billion years old, that's what we can see. However, there is a prevailing belief that the universe is actually infinite beyond those bounds. But as the universe expands, especially at the outer edge, things cross this cosmic horizon so that they no longer become visible. Now, this has actually posed a problem throughout history because there's a good chance that there are things beyond that visible boundary that might explain things about the primordial universe that we'll just never know because we can't physically observe it. And as time goes on, more and more things are going to cross that cosmic horizon. So the universe is just going to become darker to us. Fortunately, though, it's going to happen at such long time scales that it's essentially negligible. So we don't, don't have to worry about that. So uh, one of the things I think that people were curious about is um, the ESA mission Euclid and beyond that. So Euclid and the dark energy surveys coming forward like LSST. So this is a really exciting image. This is the test image of the VIS instrument on Euclid. So actually VIS, this VIS instrument was something that was worked on at MSSL. So um, one of the people at my lab basically um, is the person who who ran most of this and oversaw the development of this VIS instrument. And these images are looking at some of the deepest, darkest patches of the sky. And the hope is that we can see across universes at high redshift, especially. So AKA looking at some of the oldest parts of the universe and to try and see if we can um, map out large cosmic structures. So we do that through something called weak lensing maps or shear maps. Um, if you remember that I mentioned weak lensing before. So the idea of weak lensing is that we're going to be able to start mapping out where all the dark matter and stuff has clustered throughout the universe. And from there, through a series of complicated calculations, we're going to be able to try and extract this equation of state W. So the idea of Euclid and all of these future missions is to try and refine that value of W so we can actually see what the future of our universe is going to be. Um, yeah, and so the work that I do actually is trying to see if we can, is how to make these surveys more accurate. 